got a visit from my nephew, a young fella, he's about 14 years old. So he's knocked on my door and given me a hug and then went inside to play with my kids. Following day, he texted, he texted me, telling me that he got tested positive. And instantly, um, my throat started itching, which uh, I don't know if it's psychological or if it was a real itch. So I ran down to the testing site and uh, I got tested myself the following day. That same day, the result came back as positive. Now, that, that first day was just an itchy throat. Uh, the second day, I got the shivers. You know, the hot and cold shivers, the sweats. The third day, I started being uncoordinated, very dizzy and uncoordinated. So at this stage here, I am trying to fight it off myself, thinking that it's just, you know, your normal flu symptoms, but a little bit heavier than the actual common flu. Um, the fourth day after that, it hit my lungs. I couldn't breathe anymore. So my breath went down to, to a level where uh, I was struggling even to get a little bit of breath in. And that's when uh, my wife called the ambulance. The ambulance came, took me in, put me on oxygen straight away. So they took me straight to the Alfred. Lucky me, the Alfred had a free bed. Um, because in the Alfred they've got this, this machine which uh, it's called the ECMO machine. Anyway, I got to the hospital and the doctors tried absolutely everything. You know, they were injecting me with steroids, with antibiotics, you know, rolling me over onto my stomach. They even at one stage um, hung me upside down with my legs, trying to get my lungs working. Um, they tried absolutely everything and nothing, nothing was working. After that, the doctor came up to me, the main doctor. He came up to me and he said, look, Zane, we've tried everything and nothing's working. I've got one more option left. He said, I have to put you to sleep and take control of your lungs artificially and put you on a life support machine. He said, but in the meanwhile, I want you to say goodbye to your family because legally I'm obliged to tell you that I don't think you're gonna make it, but we'll give it a crack anyway and we'll see how we go. And uh, that's how the ordeal started. You see, the problem with corona and the symptoms of corona is they still don't know. They're still learning themselves. You see, at the moment I've still got, my lungs are scarred. Half of them are scarred and the other half are inflammated. Now, if I got that from smoking, they know how to treat it because they've got certain medication and exercises that will treat that. However, because I got it from corona, that medication and those exercises aren't working. So it's just a learning process for them too, which is making it hard because there's no COVID specialists yet. Well, the, the, in reality, I wasn't anti-vax. I wasn't pro-vax either. I also believed in um, free of choice. Um, it's my body, I, you know, I do what I please with it. So really I was sitting on the fence, waiting to see, you know, results and proper research. Um, this is pre-COVID. This is not pre-COVID, pre-me being infected. That was my stance back then. However, after being infected by COVID, and I respect the opinion of everyone's free to do what they like with their own body. However, I have become pro-vax. Why? Because here I am, I'm in hospital. I've got all these doctors and these nurses that are working on me. I'm infected and I'm infectious, so I can infect people too. They're actually carrying me, turning me over. We're, we're literally nose to nose with each other. And they're immune from this sickness because they're vaxxed. The vaccine is not a preventative. It's not gonna stop you from getting infected. However, it will uh, help your body fight it off much easier. And the, the, the symptoms that you will cop are much more mild. COVID hits different people differently. There are many people that passed away from COVID and they had much less symptoms than me. 
You see, in the ward that we were in, there was 14 of us. We all had the same sickness. We were all in there in the ICU. 14 of us, 12 died. There was only two that survived, me and another brother. His name's Muhammad Koda. And subhanAllah, all of the 12 had less symptoms than me. And they all passed away. Not on the same day, gradually throughout the ICU. Uh, I'm in pain. To put more pain into me, I'm not willing to put up with that. I just want to get better. You know, I just want to improve. I want to, you see, I've been diagnosed now with something called long COVID. And the doctors are saying it will take approximately two years to recover. You see, when the doctor said to me that I'm not going to make it, it worked in two ways with me. First, it devastated me, absolutely killed me. So I think I was gonna die before I even got put in a coma because of the mental stress of knowing that that's it. But at the same time, it gave me willpower to fight. And I did say back to the doctor, I'm not gonna say goodbye to my family. I'm not gonna make them start grieving while there's still a Adam's weight of, of hope. I held on to it and it gave me willpower and I, had, and I started fighting from day one. And I think with the help of Allah, that's why I'm still here. They weren't allowed to be in the hospital because of COVID restrictions. You got no support, you got no love. You need your family around you at times like this. And the hospital didn't allow them to even enter the front door, let alone being in the room. And during that time, when my wife was infected too. She got infected either off me or off my nephew. She was in hospital herself. Thank God for my daughter who came and looked after the kids. And because I've got a 24 year old, my daughter Ella, she looked after the kids in the house, at least for the first three or four days that my wife was in hospital. When my dad was told that he was going to be put in a coma and on life support, he called me on FaceTime and he was worried about me more than himself because I was positive as well. So just before they were putting me in a coma, he actually FaceTimed me and said, are you okay? How are you feeling now? And he couldn't even breathe properly and he's trying to make sure I'm doing all right. And then he said to me, look, they're gonna put me in a coma. It's only gonna be five days maximum. I'll be up soon and I'll call you again. Just make sure you take care of yourself. And all these things, he did not make it sound like a big deal at all. He just said, there's a few things they can't do while I'm awake. And um, so that was that. There was no goodbyes or anything because it didn't feel like a situation where we had to say goodbye. I didn't want myself to, you know, to go astray or to start questioning and say, why me? You know, there's pedophiles out there that deserve this. Why do I have to cop this? I haven't upset anybody in my life. Why am I somebody that should, you know, cop such a test? I didn't want that to happen. So I said to the doctor, if you're gonna do it, don't let me sleep tonight without you putting me in the coma. And he actually did. But from that time until I was put in a coma, it was a lot of panic. The, the beauty part of the coma, uh, well, pre-coma, was this nurse walked in now, they've given me something to put me to sleep. Because I was panicking so much, I can't remember if it was a needle or if it was something orally. I just can't remember, or if it's, it was a mouthpiece. Why I can't remember is because they injected me with so many things and they gave me so much medication. I just can't remember which one was the actual coma. But I remember as I was laying down, I was on my stomach and my head was on the pillow. One of the nurses walked in, it was a male. Now, I don't know if he was Muslim or not Muslim. I couldn't tell. And he said to me, Zane, can I see your phone, please? So I thought he wanted to call my family or something. So I've unlocked it and I've given it to him. He opened up YouTube. He put Surat Yasin. He pushed play and he put it under my pillow. And that's what I went to sleep to. And it was about five minutes later where I dozed off. And it was, it was just a fantastic thing. It was amazing. And like my eyes started tearing when I seen, when I started hearing 
the Qur'an coming out from somebody. Look, if he was Muslim, may Allah reward him. If he was non-Muslim, may Allah guide him. It was just an amazing gesture. Um, and that, that's what I went to sleep to. It made me relax. The panic went away, you know? It was five or 10 minutes later where I dozed off. When my dad was considered the sickest patient that they had, I got a call from a Dr. Adrian. He was the principal investigator of the Redeem pilot study, which involved putting the patient on an ECMO machine and a few other little things. And as the medical treatment decision maker of my dad, I had to provide consent as to whether or not I was okay with him uh, joining this study. And even though there was a lot of possible pros, there were also like side effects and cons as well. And nothing was promised. So it didn't mean that putting him onto this study meant that he was gonna get better. It was still a probability. Um, that was a very hard decision that I had to make because I didn't really understand much of it. So I had to have a few doctors explain it to me and had to read the study that they sent me through to my email. The most horrific part of the ordeal was the coma. What I went through before the coma and what I went through after I woke up was very hard. Why? Because the thing is in the coma people think that you're peacefully sleeping, but you're not. I think it was for the first week or two I was knocked out, I was asleep, but after that I woke up. I woke up, I was awake, I was aware, but I was drugged whatever they were injecting into me. So for a whole two months of the coma, there's a lot of fear. You feel like you're in the grave, you're suffocating, you're paralyzed, and there's nothing you can do about it. There's nobody you can talk to. You can't say anything because you can't talk. You know what's happening around you, but you can't comprehend it 100%. You know, you're trying to scream out to people to save you from what you're in but it's not working because nothing's coming out. Um, like I remember when the nurse started to shave my beard, to shave it off because they, they couldn't fit the mouthpiece on properly because of the beard. And I remember as soon as she touched my beard with the, with the razor, I actually remember it very clearly where I told her stop. And she said, we have to. And I said, no, work something else out, please stop and then I dozed off again, um, but she shaved my beard. <laughs> One of the nurses came up to me in my dream and said, Zane, they're playing with you. Just get up and leave. I actually saw that nurse after I woke up, believe it or not. The nurse that I saw in my dream, I saw her and I, said, and I called her over and I said to her, um, you were telling me to get up and leave. Why? What conspiracy was going on? She looked at me, she smiled, and she said, then why didn't you leave? I said, because I can't move. <laughs> I'm paralyzed. You know, and then she laughed and walked off. Obviously, it was just in the coma process. I even saw a doctor, one of the female doctors. She came up to me and said, Zane, I'm here to help you. Don't worry about what's going on. I'll get you out of here. And I saw that doctor too when I woke up, you know? And every time she'd walk past my room, she'd look into my room and I think, she knows, she's looking at me. And then I noticed every time someone walks past my room, they look into the room, it's just natural, <laughs> you know. It's, it's an amazing story with my kidneys. My kidneys collapsed, so I wasn't passing urine anymore. I, was, I couldn't go to the toilet anymore. Uh, when I woke up, I was, they, they were getting me prepared to do the dialysis you know, and wash out my kidneys once a week. So they had already prepared that program for me. And then finally they let my wife visit. This is after I've woken up. Um, she's come in and she had a little bit of Zamzam water. And at that time I had the, uh, the ventilator in my neck. So I couldn't talk and I wasn't allowed to eat or drink because I was being fed through my nose. Um, so she sneaked it in and she made me drink it. So I've grabbed it and, and she made me drink it over three times too. Um, so I've, I've drank it 
And as soon as I finished it, I've looked at her and I'm yelling out to her, but no voice is coming out because I can't talk. Dad, I need the bottle, give me the bottle. And she's just, what's wrong? What do you need? And she's grabbing everything but the bottle. You know, do you want this? No, the bottle. Do you want this? No, no. Until I passed urine. And just before my wife walked in, she had spoken to the doctor about the dialysis. And then she, and they told her, your kidneys are gone. So she ran back out, called the doctor in, and when the doctor saw what he saw, that I passed urine and everything went fine, he was shocked. SubhanAllah, that little bit of zamzam water, wallahi, and with the reliance of Allah, she really believed that this is gonna work, it's gonna help you, and it did, SubhanAllah. Uh, th that's the beauty of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it's just amazing. Um, SubhanAllah, this, when you rely on Allah, sincerely, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill what you're relying on Him for. But you've got to have that reliance. And I learned that throughout this ordeal. Now my kidneys are back to normal. Fully functioning, back to normal. Because of that. Hey, Habibi. Keep back, ya Habibi. Keep back, ya Albi. Bismillah alaik. Alhamdulillah, ya Rabbi. Lili, 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 lili. الحمد لله يا ربي الحمد لله كيفك يا روحي وينو علي وينو علي عيد علي يا قلبي يا روحي يا عيني وينو علي عيد له العالي روحي جيبي علي بسم الله عليك ايه ما تبكي لا ما عم بكي مبسوط مبسوطة كتير أنا مبسوطة أنا مبسوطة كتير after two and a half months in a coma I came to, to, to the state where I couldn't handle it anymore. This horrible state that I was in, you know, I turned up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I raised my hands, this is during my dream. I raised my hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I said, Ya Allah, I know I'm not dead because I haven't seen Malik al-Mawt yet. And I know I'm not in the grave, even though it feels like it, because I haven't seen Munkar and nakir yet. So I know I'm still alive. I said, oh Allah, either take me and get me out of this situation or return me back to my family. And then I closed my eyes and I started making shahada, remembering what the doctor was saying. And I made about a hundred shahadas, just shahada after shahada. And then after that, I opened my eyes and I was awake. That's the moment I woke up. And that's the moment I looked up and there was doctors and nurses and they started jumping up and they were celebrating because I woke up. And that's the moment they switched off the life support machine. And that's the moment I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, you've done well, but it was Allah that saved me. So you can enjoy, you can celebrate as much as you want, but in, this is I'm telling myself because I still can't talk but it was Allah that saved me. And it was at that moment I broke down straight away. I broke down just out of thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya Rabb, Anta al-Hafiz, Ya Allah. Fazalna awladuna masri shabab nasuq. Ya Rabb. The Alfred and the Cabrinis. So what I would love to say to the doctors is, I'm very grateful because they did not give up on me. From day one until the time I got out of hospital, they did not give up on me at all. So I'm very grateful and I really, really appreciate everything the doctors and the nurses did. The nurses were fantastic, especially in the ICU. Fantastic. Um, they went above and beyond also. So I'm very, very grateful. And I will be sending you flowers and, and, and some sweets, Lebanese sweets. <laughs>
حبيب قلبي زينب So I travelled to Pakistan back in 1993, me and my father. Um, we travelled there to do khuruj with the Tablighi Jama'ah. And it was a great experience, it was beautiful. We went there to do 40, uh, four months. Um, but as soon as I got there, my father suggested, you know, why don't I stay there? I was 17. Why don't I stay there and study some Quran and that? Um, so he organized with the, the mashayikh there to um, send us to one of those uh, Quran schools, the boarding Quran schools. Me and my dad went there we got to know the teachers and the principal and, and the system and it was just an amazing place. It was so beautiful, so humble. And I told my dad, you know, you go finish your khuruj, I'm staying here. And once you finish your khuruj, go back home. I'm staying here. Um, I had a bit of an issue with my visa because our visa was just for four months. But the school actually worked it out. You know, they, they've got their connections. They worked it out for me and uh, I stayed for three years. Came back at 21, and after that, in 1996, it was, I started teaching at Dar al Alum in Faulkner. From there, uh, they gave me the experience, they gave me the platform, I'm very grateful for them. From there, I, I left, I went to East Preston Islamic College, I'd done three years there, and then from there, I went to Australian International Academy, and I'd done one year there. So all up, I taught for 10 years. Now back then, my last year teaching was 2007. Back then you were overworked, underpaid. Now I've got all these kids, single income. It was very difficult to keep up because the pay wasn't, wasn't the best. Then we went into business. I went into the security industry. She went into, she stayed in the education industry. And then subhanAllah, my wife's business boomed. So I sold off my business so I can support her with her business. And until today, uh, we're still in the education industry, uh, running dawn to dusk. We offer courses for adults in all different fields, you know, certificates two, certificates three, four, and diplomas in all different types of um, fields and qualifications. And that's where we are at the moment. So that's the Pakistan, the teaching, and what we're doing now. I had the power, I had the money, I had the, the time where I can give Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I, it was very minimal at that time. That's the only regret. I was only doing what was obligated. I wasn't doing that extra. When I was, subhanAllah, when I was in, um, uh, in the coma itself, also, um, I was thinking about me now passing away and I've got this tattoo on my arm. And I was thinking, how can I face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with such a thing? Which is haram, um, changing the form of Allah. And it's haram. And I was thinking, I'm not ready to meet Allah yet. Ya Allah, I'm not ready to meet you. I need to remove this. And subhanAllah, you don't understand. When I got out of hospital actually, my wife came up to me and showed me a message of a certain business that does laser and tattoo removal. They said that they will remove it for free. And this is after I got out of hospital and she showed me and I've been in the process now so far. So SubhanAllah, Allah even made that path easy for me too, where I don't even have to pay for it. And SubhanAllah, is amazing. My New Year's resolution is Turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make Allah your first priority and think about yourself before you think about anybody else because if you're happy and comfortable then the people around you that you love that you're responsible for will also be happy and comfortable socially physically religiously psychologically you look after yourself it that also it pays off 
with the people that are around you and the people that you're responsible for. But if you're miserable and you're overworked and you're not religious, that also affects the people that uh, you're responsible for and that you love and that are people that are around you. You know, it brushes off on them too. So turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Follow the teachings of our Prophet alayhi salatu um, Because wallahi, in a blink of an eye, Allah can take you. In a blink of an eye, just like what happened to me. One day, I'm this big strong man. The next day, I'm worthless.